Yeehaw, that was rocking. Hey, check this out. In this problem, we want, to, we want to consider what happens when somebody tries to go around the inside of a vertical loop. And so um, some of the issues we've got to worry about here are the safety factor, the idea that this person's got to be in contact with the loop the entire time in order to be safe. If they lose contact with the loop, they're going to fall down somewhere and smash themselves down in the uh, lower part of the loop. So we formalize this problem by setting up a consider the following kind of scenario. This is a 65 kilogram circus performer trying to uh, try perform a uh, vertical loop trick. For simplicity, we'll make the track frictionless and um, we'll consider what happens when the circus performer centripetally accelerates around the vertical loop and they, you're given the radius and some of the specific details. And most importantly, what we want to know is how high above the loop does the performer have to start at in order to safely make the loop. So we're going to call that initial height A, like the initial position of the performer at this location is height A, and then they're going to perform the trick, slide back up to some uh, similar height, and then back again, and I guess indefinitely can, uh, complete this trick. But most importantly, we're interested in what's happening right there at the top of the loop. Uh, We'll call that position B, say. And we're going to solve this problem using the conservation of energy. So let's look at the uh, energy diagrams. How much energy is at each location? At the beginning, where they're not moving, they start at rest, have no kinetic energy. Uh, their potential energy bucket is completely full. At the lowest point in the loop, they have uh, no potential for gravity to do work because they're at the lowest point. So all of the energy in the system has been converted to kinetic energy. And then if they, if they were able to complete the loop successfully, they might end up at the, on the other side of the loop uh, by conserving energy, have the same potential that they started with, no kinetic when they stop at the highest point there. And then at the top of the loop, that's what we're most interested, they, um, they're not as high as they were to begin with, so they still they don't have the maximum potential energy, and they have to still be moving at the top of the loop in order to maintain contact and be safe. So they have to have some kinetic energy. Now, I'm not totally sure about the proportions between the two, but I know that the sum of these two, potential plus kinetic, have to equal 100% of the initial energy in the system. So let's work out these details. Let's call this position A and the top of the loop position B, and then conserve energy between positions A and B. A statement of conservation of mechanical energy looks like this, and it's simpler just to write E for energy, E for mechanical energy, to subscript A and B. And then what mechanical energy is, is the sum of gravitational potential plus kinetic energy. And that sum before uh, the event is the same as the sum any time after the event. Or, I guess, more importantly, at any position after said event. So each potential and kinetic energy term is expressed as um, mgh and 1 half mv squared, subscript a in this case. And then the same two terms subscripted in b. And those two terms correspond to these boxes, these energy boxes we looked at in the diagram before. And since the, the performer starts at rest, they have no kinetic energy to begin with. So we can reduce this to just the gravitational potential they start with, equaling the gravitational potential and the kinetic energy they have at the top of the loop. I see m, the mass of the performer, is in each one of the terms, so I can divide each side by m. And that ratio of mass to mass equals 1, so I just uh, remove that. And then I notice that the, the h at a term is what we're looking for, and the height at b term is the height at the top of the loop. Well, that's just twice the radius or the diameter of the loop. So my next step, I'm going to substitute in the height at b for 2r. And then now I recognize, hey, this is strange. Um, height of a is what I'm looking for, but what is the speed at the top of the loop uh, associated with how much kinetic energy do they have there? So that's a little troublesome. Here I just divided by g everywhere, so this g canceled, that g canceled, each, each ratio went to 1, but then I have to divide by g on this side here, and that's how that ends up. And then now i got to ask myself the question, what is the minimum safe speed that the clown can travel at without losing contact at the top of the loop? So I'm going to consider a uh, circular motion problem for a minute. Now at the top of that loop, they still have potential and kinetic energy, and we're interested in that kinetic energy term. So let's figure out what speed they must have there by summing some forces. Let's look at the weight force and the normal force pushing them down. And then 
with a Newton's second law of motion argument, both those forces point to the center of the circle. And I'm going to consider what happens in the limit as the normal force gets infinitely close to zero without actually reaching zero. So that's a mathematical way of allowing me to consider when the normal force is essentially zero. So it doesn't add in a meaningful way to the weight force, but I'm not letting it actually reach zero so that um, I still have contact between this, the performer and the top of the loop. So in that limit, I just have the weight force at the very top pulling me down. Divide by m again, let that ratio go to 1, and I can figure out symbolically that the speed I have to have at the top of the loop to maintain contact, this is the minimum speed to maintain contact, it's got to be equivalent to the square root of g uh, times the radius of the loop. And that's pretty cool. So that minimum safe speed then I can use in my conservation of energy argument. So let's walk through this steps, these steps again. Now here, there's my speed at point b right there. I'm going to replace that with the square root of rg. Now, so this speed at point b squared is now the square root of rg squared. And when I square the square root, the radical goes away. And I can cancel out these g's. Look at this. Isn't that amazing? I've got two r's plus a half of an r. That's two and a half r's, or five halves r as an improper fraction. And that's it. The minimum starting height, independent of mass, uh, independent of time, independent of acceleration. I just need to start at a height that is two and a half times higher than the radius of the loop. So if I had a loop radius of 10 meters, I'd have to start up here at 25 meters. That would be my minimum height. What fun. Uh, try this and other problems on your own. Good luck.